I will begin my presentation by sharing some aspects of the thinking and process that led to this exhibition while showing excerpts from Gordon Meta Clark's previously unseen footage and films. Like the previous projects in this exhibition series, I was invited to choose a related topic or an aspect of Mata Clark's work that is of particular interest to me. And since I'm a curator who was mostly uh, working with moving images and particularly with expanded cross-disciplinary, even to say transdisciplinary, uh, notions of documentary film, I was drawn to the film archive. The Mata Clark film archive here in the CCA consists of hundreds of items. It is not yet fully catalogued, nor has been fully explored. Some of the material is in fragile condition. Some has not been looked at for decades. The narratives related to the archive are multiple. For example, in the 80s, when working on the first museum exhibition and publication of Mata Clark, the European curator Corinne Dizarance and Jane Crawford, who is also here tonight, uh, in charge of the estate, apparently opened the box which contained a lot of film and video material. The works that appeared more or less complete were restored over time with private means and with the assistance of mostly European museums. They have since been widely circulated. Yet uncertainty remains as to how the films were considered complete. And as far as I understand it, uh, what didn't enter the official filog filmography ended up in the archives here, with, of course, copies of the official films. What I thought to do for this project was to basically take some of the material out of the box and see how it relates to the completed official films in circulation. This task uh, could not be called a research project as such, nor a proper investigation. I was also not able to see all the material that is here, nor gain a comprehensive overview of what is in the box. Due to its uh, condition, the film material had to be digitalized before it could be viewed. And since we could not simply digitalize all of it, it had to be pre-selected, blindly if you will, with the content of the film and footage identified only by way of its labels, which were not always clear, nor noted, nor systematic. Mata Clark collaborated with a lot of different people at different times. And how specific reel is tagged depends on who was in charge of the camera, of editing, of archiving. In many cases, we don't know who was behind the annotation. However, we were able to identify some of the material, and the project is a good beginning and a suggestion for what could be researched in the future. I limited my task to the outtakes and rough cuts from Mata Clark's building cuts. The large scale cuts is meticulous and monumental incisions into abandoned, dilapidated buildings in New York and Paris. Those are his uh, most iconic works. As you know, none of the actual cuts have survived as such. They were either bored up or demolished shortly after their completion. What survives is their mediated image. I was interested in the building cuts film material above all for the relation between the building cuts and the editing of moving image sequences, as in cutting and cutting. Mata Clark carefully documented the demanding process of disassembling, removing, and reorganizing the outer and inner divides of his buildings. The cutting films, splitting, day's end, conical intersect, bingo, and office baroque, impressively document the process of his transformation of architectural structures in the mid-70s. The films show how the cuts exposed the building's material and anatomies, how they uncovered historical layer, offering new angles of perception, and fused private and public space by opening building up to the elements and to the people. The cuts also oscillates between the state of movement and stasis, both in conceptual and physical terms. What seems fixed and static turns into dynamic process, which alternates between interior and exterior, visible and invisible, private and public, 
individual and collective. Containerized spaces, containerized bodies in spaces, containerized minds in bodies are somehow released by shifts and tilts of the center of gravity, an inversion of what is considered to be above and below. The cut creates a space of possibility, of a beginning. Moving image is the most suitable medium to reflect this dynamism, and sometimes it succeeds. There is some truly remarkable material to be found in the box of outtakes and rough cuts, some of which you can see in the show for the very first time. It is work that has not lost its unsettling spirit. There is some fantastic footage of splitting, for example, that famous cut of a family house in New Jersey in 1974. Uh, this is the site where Meta Clark performed his first building cut, uh, Inglewood, a working class neighborhood that was uh, later on demolished for an urban renewal project. And this shot is taken uh, just before the cutting begins, so in the phase of preparation. What makes this material different from the film that is known is simply that you see far more of the surroundings of the environment, of the urban and social context. As you know, later on, this house will be sliced open exactly in the middle of it, and the back part of it will be tilted in a degree that allows uh, natural light to enter the interior spaces. These original uh, shots are, to a certain extent, undoing the work of abstraction which uh, characterizes Mata Clark's uh, documentation. And here, for example, we see the pile of furniture and other belongings of the family that used to live in this house before it was set for demolition. Uh, Mata Clark cleared out all the personal belongings, uh, all the traces left behind by the former tenants before he started his uh, cutting. This exhibition also includes uh, unknown shots from the project Day's End from 1975, uh, the cut in the abandoned 19th century industrial building on the west side of Manhattan's waterfront, an area that was a hub of underground gay and queer culture and a site of dangerous crime. The existing known film of Day's End seems uh, somewhat incomplete as uh, it is not including shots of the completed work, uh, the space after the artist's uh, intervention. Uh, what we are showing here are the sequences that were left out of the official film, but which uh, capture elements of the work that can be considered as totally essential to it, particularly the relationship between static matter and movement as seen in the reflections of light on water. This play of light was enabled by the highly calculated positioning and shape of the cuts to the building facade. So Mata Clark observed and studied the movement of the direct light as it was hitting the building facade through different moments of the day and the different moments of the year. And this was the basis uh, for defining the shape and position of the cuts. 
He conceived this work as an interior park. He called it a festival of water and light. He also stated that the work starts at noon when the sun is in zenith, and therefore its title, Day's End. In the case of Conical Intersect of 1975, the artist bore a cone-shaped void through two dilapidated 17th century buildings on Rue Beaubourg in Paris, not far from the Centre Pompidou, which was then under construction. The work was conceived as an anti-monument to the destruction of the old inner center of Paris. It was Mata Clark's most visible building cut, clearly seen from the busy central passageway, where heavy traffic, cars and pedestrians became spectators in a form of public theater. Mata Clark associated conical intersect with cinema, calling it a show of sound and light. It was also allegedly inspired by the landmark structural film by uh, Anthony McCall, titled Line Describing a Con from 1973. McCall's work exposed the materiality of light shared by a film projector as essential to the experience of cinema. On view in the exhibition are a couple of working edits of the film documenting Conical Intersect and its production. It includes previously unknown shots of the construction phases along with alternative takes, and for the first time, the soundtrack which was once considered lost. And I would like to thank Jane Crawford for finding the sound and for sharing it with us. In the film, and I will run a short uh, excerpt in a minute, we hear Mata Clark interviewing the witnesses of his urban performance, the people in the street, for their opinion of the demolition of Leal, the once uh, central market of Paris. Je travaille dans le quartier et je l'avais remarqué plusieurs fois. J'ai trouvé ça assez amusant, alors euh, original surtout. Maintenant, j'ai appris que c'était un, une sculpture d'un un sculpteur américain. Pendant un moment, j'ai pensé que c'était un... Quand ils détruisent les, les maisons, ils, ils utilisent une espèce de, de grosse boule en fonte qu'ils envoient dans la, dans la maison. Alors je me suis dit, c'est peut-être un effet du hasard. Et puis alors, elle a creusé la, la pièce. Et puis après réflexion, en fait, ce serait trop, trop beau parce qu'il y a les, le plancher qui est découpé et tout. Enfin, il faut avouer que c'est assez, assez, assez bien. original. Vous êtes intrigué par le rond Oui. Je ne sais pas. Il y a... Monsieur m'a dit que c'était fait pour 
faire arti artistiquement, enfin, ça avait été fait euh, comme ça pour... Euh... Ça permet, euh, ça permet oui, la tirelle, là, oui. <rire> On voit comment les maisons ont été faites. <rire> ça aussi, oui. What you see here in the exhibition, however, is only a peek into the archive, not a spectacular discovery that finally solves some of the riddles and myths which characterize Mata Clark's legacy. The exhibition is simply a glimpse. A lot of what was digitalized as part of my commission is also on view. So that's quite literally what it is, a show of outtakes, work cuts, and rough cuts the footage disregarded or processed towards the final cut with some additional materials. And although this is mostly material that wasn't used by Mata Clark and his co-editors, it seems to me that there is no violation, no crossing of boundaries to be showing it here, and the reason for this lies in the open-ended nature of the work and the status of the films in particular. With uh, the right resources and time, there is great scope to consider in depth the documentary status of Mata Clark's film work. It is a tricky subject and concerns not only Mata Clark, but a large number of artists who abandoned the gallery and the object nature of the artwork, who went site-specific and engaged in temporal processes. One could begin by juxtaposing two points of view. Firstly, that the documentation of Mata Clark's cut is only secondary to the experience of the physical work. Nothing can reproduce the actual vertigo, the strange pull of gravity, the liberating and uncanny sense of release affected by his cuts of destruction. And to a certain extent, this is the position that Mata Clark maintained regarding most of his material, even when he prepared it for gallery shows and artist books as highly reworked photographic documentation. But another view holds that the documentation is not secondary at all, quite the contrary. This position is best argued by Mark Wigley in his inspiring forensic investigation of the Unarchitecture Group and their infamous exhibition at Green Street in 1972. In Cutting Meta Clark, his book published last year, Wigley argues that Mata Clark was progressively seeking to maximize the effects of his cutting. And similar to a surgical operation, each work was conceived as a kind of performance or even a dance that extended into, quote, deepening the physical photographic entanglement. And to such an effect that in works like Threshold from 72, and Bronx Floor Hall from 73, quote, the roles of cutting and photographing kept flipping. Indeed, the building cuts were never simply cuts of buildings. Rather, as Wigley writes, they were complex multimedia performances sustained by creating precisely calibrated resonances between different spaces and different media, end of quote. In uh, 74, Mata Clark began dating his assemblages of photographs, the collages he was making, rather than the original cuts, shifting their status from documentary material towards artwork. As Wigley insists, this was a mean to achieve an expansion of the work into different media. And the fact that Mata Clark upheld the distinction between document and art was in order to allow it each to receive the value of the other, the document to receive the value of art and the art to receive the value of the document. The cutting of the photographs to make the collages was just one way in which the building cuts extended and were analogized. 
just as, quote, no cut was never singular or finished, as Wigley writes, but indeed to be redone and redone. A cut is only a cut when recut, end of quote. And Mata Clark did this by framing the documentation of a cut and its effect doubly, by documenting the act of cutting and the subsequent recutting of the documents. So Mata Clark's photographic works are not evidential, uh, fateful records at all. The photograph might even be thought of as both extending and preceding the physical cut. For example, with the collages made of splitting, we might come to the uneasy realization that, as Wigley states, quote, it is a house cut by an image more than an image of a cut house, end of quote. An image as a cut or as a division occurs in several ways in the work of Mata Clark. For example, it is used as a framing device, what it shows and what it leaves out. It is also used to hide and reveal the physical materiality of the image, its material carrier, that which lies behind its motives. Just like a wall in architecture, an image is a division. And just like the walls of a building, the division disappears into the background. It becomes the condition and the context, not the object of perception. For how do we perceive a building in our everyday lives? In a mode of destruction, as Walter Benjamin famously suggested, in our peripheral vision as an embodied and sensuous knowledge, as implicit knowledge, and as that which is simply appears to us as a given. It is precisely this perception of architecture as a given and as real that is laid bare and exposed by the cuts of Mata Clark. Mata Clark's cutting and slicing expose also the facade of social structure, of a social order that usually remains hidden in its materialization. Architecture, one could say, remains invisible, naturalized, just like the concepts of profit and private property and the modes of subjectivity they depend on, unless they are being exposed by being cut open. Or to say it another way, the image of what appears as a given, as natural, as static and real, is a deception. It is a sort of false objectivity. How to break with this image has been, since uh, George Lukács, the Marxist question of realism, a question crucial to the discussion on the critical potential of art and of documentary. Mata Clark's uh, work clearly stands in this tradition, along with Brestian estrangement and the situationist uh, detournement. So there is clearly a lot to be considered here. And rather than presenting anything conclusive, I feel it is best to leave you with these questions and propositions. Wigley suggests that Mata Clark's architectural training <coughs> informed his refusal to draw any line between the physical and the conceptual. Perhaps this argument can be taken further. Mata Clark was an artist. His refusal to be an architect was based on how he saw the conceptual and the physical simultaneously at work in every dimension of reality, underlying the creation of every image. He explored this vision in the zone of art applied to the lived environment to question the static, inert nature of the containerized spaces we inhabit. It is as if he wanted to turn lines into spaces, to open the visions from within. The performance of the cut also delineates the uncut. The uncut is a way to describe the relational social space that Mata Clark's thought to work within. I initially wanted the term uncut to appear in the exhibition title. It is a wordplay, of course. The outtakes and rough cuts are uncut to a certain degree. But there is also the uncut as a theoretical proposition. 
It is an idea of social space as not defined by division, a social space that is not constructed upon division. Perhaps the building cuts attempted to level out social divisions and open up an experience of the uncut, something that also remains beyond the reach of language. And in a certain way, the relational, communal space of the uncut, where our own borders cannot be maintained, is the filmic documentation. This is because the films, and especially the outtakes and rough cuts, invert the photographic documentation that clearly frame or abstract the event of the work. The uncut films simply show it all, the people, the context, the huge amount of stuff that was cleared from the houses as they were prepared for surgery. Mata Clark himself suggested that film is more accurate as a medium, more capable to capture complexity. It certainly does capture what he called performative and theatrical. But film might have a much more significant relation to Mata Clark's overall architectural project, particularly in terms of what the physical cuts are doing between the relation of stasis and movement, transformation and fixation, appearance and concealment. Film is similar to architecture in this way. Both create an illusion of reality in material form. However, film creates the illusion of movement, while architecture creates the illusion of permanence, the annulment of time. I'd like to suggest uh, therefore, that Mata Clark's architectural cuts are cinematographic. My intuition is that he wanted to make a cinema like what he did to architecture. What does it mean to make a work following line describing a con, the work that defines the essence of cinema as architecture with light? I suggest that Conical Intersect is a radically materialized cinema, a cinema that is taken out of the box beyond the metaphor of Plato's cave, where light play is no longer an illusion, rather the real sun. And what if we think of the exhibition sequence of Day's End, especially the stunning dance of sun reflection? We can think about it in the same way as a liberation of cinema from the expectation of the black box. The film documents of Mata Clark on exhibition are remarkable for bringing back the context that was to a certain extent erased, lost, cut out of the images in circulation. This exhibition also brings back more of the communal, collective, messy aspects of Mata's and Mata Clark's work. In the process of making this project, we found remarkable footage shot in the artist-run restaurant Food, which Mata Clark along with his close friends and collaborators, opened in 71 at Prince Street in Soho. So I would like to end by showing you previously unseen material of this place and what I consider a real social space. Thank you. <laughs>